very much, uh, Arti, and uh, this is a very, very interesting and uh, uplifting pilgrimage. Uh, I'm sure our participants really enjoyed today, and I will be sharing my experience uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, so I'm certain that it will not come as a great surprise to any of you that studying in the Holy Land in Jerusalem has changed uh, the entire course of my life forever. And this was not clear at the beginning of the journey for uh, I had up until that point never left my home, Armenia, Yerevan. And at that time I found myself uh, in this strange and yet mysterious holy place, uh, holy land of Jerusalem. And I remember the beginning of this journey quite vividly as if it were just yesterday, but it was about 13 years ago. And it, was, and it all started uh, in a biblical town of Jerusalem, uh, whereby our Dean, um, Har Theodoros, he's still the Dean of the seminary, took myself and my fellow freshman seminarians through a tour of the crown jewel of Jerusalem. So first, the first place was uh, Holy Sepulchre and then uh, the other holy places of Jerusalem as well. And a church of the Holy Sepulchre and a tomb of Virgin Mary. So my classmates and I were amazed at the stunning beauty of those sanctuaries. So uh, every moment we spent there was in humility and not, not only for the first time, but whenever I visited those holy places, but for the first time uh, as well, uh, we knew very well that we were roaming about the very grounds where the Virgin Mother fell asleep. Uh, so before entering this marvelous and historic church, nobody would tell what was inside. Uh, so the doors were like very, very simple and plain doors. Nobody would say that there is a uh, tomb and that tomb was Virgin Mother's tomb. And we then entered the church and went down to that very place. And all of a sudden, we all were greeted with an altar built on a rock, which had a strange opening door from where pilgrims from all around the world would come and go inside, bow, kiss, pray on the tomb of Virgin Mary. So that very tomb and the sanctuary didn't challenge me at all because I knew why I left Armenia, my hometown, and willingly went to study in the Holy Land. It is correct that uh, I've seen many churches and monasteries, very, very beautiful and old monasteries in Armenia, but none of these monasteries and all sanctuaries uh, uh, for me could be compared with either tomb of Jesus Christ or the tomb of Aspaza, my Virgin Mary. And I need to admit that every time uh, I prayed at the tomb of Virgin Mary, my soul was comforted and all my trials and tribulations as a student who left Armenia and as a young person being far from my family were calmed, calmed down and comforted. Uh, the tomb of Virgin Mary always filled me with the grace of God. And every time after celebrating divine liturgy, at the tomb of Virgin Mary, and we do it very uh, frequently. Uh, and departing that very sanctuary, I always ran, uh, went uh, inside the tomb of Virgin Mary, prayed, kissed the tomb of Virgin Mary, and left. And every time when I was kissing and praying at the tomb or on the tomb of Virgin Mary, I always uh, remember that I'm kissing and praying and Virgin, at Virgin Mary's tomb, who carried the Son of God in her womb and became the mother of all those who worship her son. And as a young uh, student uh, seminarian, deliberating my future uh, in the church and growing my relationship, relationship with God, a question began to flood my thoughts. Uh, and those, those are the questions. How am I going to respond in the face of this truth to that huge responsibility that God gave me by leading me to live uh, and study among uh, all the holy sites of Jerusalem? So I'm not talking about the tomb of Virgin Mary, but in, in, in general. 
or in what ways uh, can I make sure that my response to this truth is acceptable and, and in service to the Lord? And I think my response uh, is found in who I am today, today as an Armenian priest. And as the years have passed, I realized uh, that it, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ and the empty tomb of Virgin Mary can also be symbolically found outside of Jerusalem. It is to be found all around me, first of all, uh, and not just in the faraway holy places of the world, but all around me, uh, even here and now in Wisconsin in, mid in the Midwest. And the chances for me to be humble as the empty tomb of Mary rep represents. So this begs the question, how will I personally face this truth and how am I going to choose to respond? Uh, and I believe it to be a great privilege to speak to you regarding my experience at the tomb of Virgin Mary. And I take it to be nothing less than a miracle that those holy places were born uh, symbolically in my heart. And being here in, in the Midwest today, uh, I'm obviously a long way away from the Holy Land. But no matter how far I happen to be today, the Holy Land, uh, the tomb of Mary still lives uh, in me today. And because in contemplating the earthly life of Aswadama, a virgin mother, uh, it is essential for me to emphasize that just as the moment of her greatest glory when she was chosen to become the mother of the savior, as well as the hour of her greatest grief, she stood at the foot of the cross and showed her love and faith in, in her savior. In all events, big or small, she always manifested the strength and beauty of her virtues, such as humility, perseverance, patience, courage, hope in the Lord and unbounded love for him. And I need to admit that, uh, when I was a student, I prayed and I asked many things from the Virgin Mother at her tomb, and all those uh, prayers were definitely answered. This is it. If, if you have some other questions regarding my experience, we'll be happy to share with you. Hyde? Yes. Thank you very, very much for sharing your experience at the Tomb of Mary. Um, Derhaid was actually in one of, uh, I, I believe, two photos in Del Revon's um, presentation. He was the one holding the chalice high up as he was standing on the stairs. That was Der Gure when he was deacon in, in Jerusalem. Um, and because we asked for photos and then I was like, yeah, I have so many of them. So he shared a few bit with us and, and we incorporated in the presentations. And so um, with that said, we received a few questions mm -hmm. and uh, we would like to, our, our other presenters are here as well. And I'm going to ask my colleague, Deacon Eric, to go over um, the questions. And as we go on, we will, the presenters will kind of answer the questions. Okay. Thank you, RB. Okay, so the first question that we received, will it be possible to watch a recording of the entire pilgrimage? <laughs> <laughs> That's a text that I get to hear most often <laughs> when my dear colleague receives a text from people. Um, so yes, we recorded the whole, uh, all these sessions and uh, we will be posting them on our website. And I'll just say, I, I've actually wanted to show this to everyone. Uh, so it's a, it's a good question that we brought it up. So we have our, our page, the, the virtual pilgrimage page uh, on our website. We will make it more evident um, once you log on to the homepage. We haven't done that yet. But here we will have all of our future pilgrimages. The Tomb of Mary one is already up there. So if you click on View Pilgrimage, it will take us to the 
to this particular pilgrimage. Um, I'm waiting for my connection to load it, okay? So we have this video um, that, we, that we kind of publicized this uh, pilgrimage for. This is where we found the digital pilgrimage package, the Zoom registration. We will update this section. And right between the map and this intro area, we will have a schedule and all the recorded sessions from today will be put up here. So anyone anywhere and anytime is able to take this particular pilgrimage and the same will be with our future ones. Uh, we will make it more easy, e more easier for you so that you'll be able to locate it on the, on the homepage. Okay, and the next question actually, RB, if you would like to pull up the Vemcar logo. Uh, there was a question about, if you could just want to talk about the background of it, the, the, the letters and uh, where that came from. The, the Vemcar itself. Right. Okay. So the, the gold cross with the VMKR. Okay, so let me just go back. So this is our main page uh, of the Vemcar. And Right at the bottom, we have this right here, which is an image, and then we have a video as, as well. So the image right here that you see is from St. Vartan Cathedral. That's the Vemkar that is put on the altar. And I can just quickly read this and then you can follow. Um, Vemkar is the digital ministry of the Eastern Diocese of the Armenian Church of America. It is the online interface of the diocese's vision building up the body of Christ. It's what we do with the VEMCAR initiative. But what VEMCAR actually is, and again, VEM is stone rock, CAR is stone rock, right? It refers to a flat stone that is consecrated by the bishop embedded within the center of the altar upon which the chalice or gospel book rests during Badarak. Now, VEMCARs, for example, if we are going to a mission parish or if uh, we're going to go to a let's say a community that doesn't have an Armenian church we can take a, a Vemkar this consecrated stone with us to that particular uh, community and we can conduct Supadarak there so with that said well, we we kind of twist this and take it to a point where we have so many people out there who are not near the Armenian church but through the Vemkar initiative, we can bring the word of God to them. So the Vemkar uh, name kind of fits into the digital ministry that we're doing. And since we have some time, I do want to show you this quick uh, minute and a half video about what Vemkar is. As the world continues to move into the digital age, the Armenian church too is faced with the battle of information. Because of this, it's crucial that we continue finding innovative ways to minister to all members of the body of Christ. Although the physical presence of the church can never be replaced since it so deeply involves all of our senses, we developed Vemkar to provide opportunities for online and in-person worship, education, and service. We encourage all faithful to explore and even contribute to our wide range of multimedia resources, whether it be our live sessions, video and podcast series, scriptural discussions, articles, activities, or even our many social media posts. In this cyber world, we as the church can grow together in our knowledge of Jesus Christ, unite in faith, equip one another, and speak the truth in love as we build the body of Christ together. Okay, so just quickly, um, as top left, as you can see the Vemkar logo, it has the cross, and then in between we have the VMKR, Vemkar, right? So this was depicted from the original layout of the St. Vartan Cathedral, Vemkar. Here we have Der Astvat Jesus Christos. So we actually put Vemkar instead of that. And we dropped the vowels because more often in Armenian manuscripts, if we don't have enough space, we can, uh, we drop the vowels out 
So we have them cut. So that's 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 what the logo is is based on. Thank you, RP. The next question is: What can we do to support the Armenian community in Jerusalem? Uh, I think the first of all, if somebody wants to support the Armenian community and the Armenian patriarchy, first of all, has to visit and witness all those holy places uh, of Jerusalem and understand and evaluate uh, the Armenian presence in the Holy Land. Because if you have never seen that, you will not be able to imagine uh, the beauty and the value of uh, the Armenian patriarchate uh, in Jerusalem. So first of all, everybody, every Christian has to visit and see uh, the holy places. Second, uh, if you want to support, you need to let uh, others know about the pres Armenian presence, uh, Armenian patriarchy's presence in Jerusalem. Uh, third, I would say uh, to keep the, the brotherhood, St. James Brotherhood in your prayers. And fourth, uh, if you can, you can uh, support the Armenian patriarchate uh, with your donations, monetary uh, donations. So other than that, uh, if you want, we can discuss it later. You can help the seminary, you can help the, the library, you can help St. Tartmanchat's uh, school. I'm sure they have some programs and the Patriarchate itself has many programs. You can contact them and they will be more happy to let you know uh, what are the programs that they are undertaking at this moment. Thank you, Dehaj. The next question, I'm going to split into two parts. Um, the question is, uh, everything that has been said about the mother of God, are those human interpretations? Are they assumptions, uh, human um, hopes and beliefs? Or are, those, are the venerations that we do passed along to us by Christ himself? Did he tell us to do these things um, that we do as far as venerating the mother of God? I'll take this question um, just simply because this morning, I don't know if this person was was present in the in the presentation that I gave. Uh, there's a couple layers to it. Part of our veneration for, I mean, if the, if the question is, did Jesus sit down, tell his disciples, you know, after I move on, um, you know, do A, B, and C when it comes to my mother? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, we don't have those kind of things written. Certainly, it's not in the Gospels that way, not that explicitly. But if you think about the, um, the natural outflowing of uh, one's feeling and devotion towards one's earthly mother, it makes sense that we would do that for the mother of the church or the mother of God, who is Mary. And so some of this is, is, is just instinctual, um, just out of who she is as, as a mother. And some of that clearly comes from um, the role that the mother of the Messiah plays. And so in the early church, people recognized her already as playing a role as the mother of the Messiah. Therefore, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you are drawn to his mother. It, it, it just works together. And um, another way is, is, is just biblically um, from the Old Testament, as I was saying earlier uh, today, that the idea of the mother of the Messiah, as I mentioned, uh, carries over into the early church and, and, the, and the natural outflowing of devotion to her develops within the church. So traditions happen, the feasts take place and, and, and things start to congeal a little bit. And a lot of these traditions come, you know, especially for the Armenian church, come out of Jerusalem and then it spreads across and it comes to Armenia by way of Jerusalem. So it's born there. It comes out to uh, Armenia and other, uh, other Christian centers in the East at the time. And then when you look at how Jesus devotes himself to his own mother. We're following his example. Just one example is when he hands um, basically us and the church over to her at the foot of the cross. Um, you know, he hands um, humanity, like I said, and the church to her. So if Jesus is going to do that and, and give devotion to her, then we certainly are going to do the same. So some of this is innate. It's a natural instinct that flows out of devotion toward Jesus. It's a, uh, innate and in, in it flows out of devotion toward uh, the mother of God herself, and then there's biblical roots in it as well, and then the tradition that blossoms within the early church spreads and, and grows from there. 
and the other part of that question is um, Jesus said that my uh, those who are my mother and brothers and sisters, those that follow my word are my mother, brothers and sisters. So does that make us the mother of God as well if we follow Christ's word? Yes, in a way we are um, also like the mother of God in that she, uh, the way that she uh, devotes herself to, to her son, uh, we do the same. The way that she says yes to him, we say yes. The way that she carries God to other people, we do the same. So there is a model there. Her role becomes our role. Uh, so in a way, we do um, identify with her. The next question is, can you explain the connections of the altars dedicated to St. Nicholas and St. Stephen in the Mother of God's tomb? Why are those saints instead of others? I think this question is probably uh, one that I should do. So the short answer is no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the St. Nicholas and the St. Stephen altars belong to the Byzantine church. And I'm not sure why specifically they have those two altars there. That's a question that Dehran might actually know something about. Um, the St. Stephen altar may have something to do with the fact that right across the street from Mary's tomb is the church of St. Stephen. And there is a, a strong tradition that that church stands on the spot where he was stoned to death and that he would have been buried in the same tomb complex near the Garden of Gethsemane. So that's one possibility. But St. Nicholas, I do not know. Der Gurek, do you have anything to add to that? I don't know. I don't know either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something to do with the Byzantine tradition. It would be very interesting to find out. Next question is, you said that by Mary's tomb, there are other tombs. I believe this is for you, Dr. Irvin. Do we know who were buried near her? Were they saints or other people? Um, I suppose that would depend a little bit on how we define saint. Um, but yes, the other, how many other tombs there were, we don't know, because um, as I mentioned this morning, a lot of that rock surface has been cut away. There is the one sample tomb that's left over the altar of Thaddeus and Bartholomew that we showed you the entrance to, sort of high up in the wall. And there are at least three other graves in the church. Um, who the people were, we don't know. Uh, her tomb is the only one that's venerated. And about the others, we really have no information that I know of. Thank you. Next question. I know that Mary was a virgin and did not have other children, but just confirming whether or not this is true, if someone wants to elaborate on her ever virginity, perpetual virginity. I'll take that question, Deacon Eric. Thank you. So the teaching of Mary's perpetual virginity is one of the longest defined dogmas of the church. It was taught by the earliest church fathers, including Tertullian, St. Athanasius, St. Ambrose, and St. Augustine. This belief continues to be held by all the ancient churches, and it was only abandoned by Protestant Christians after the Reformation. In the Armenian church, perhaps the earliest attestation we have is the ascription attributed to St. Thomas that we proclaim after singing of the Trisagion Surpas Vads in our daily services. When we say glorified and blessed ever virgin Astvadzadzin, or birth giver of God, Mary, mother of Christ. An important historical document which also supports the teaching of Mary's perpetual virginity is the Protevangelium of James, which I mentioned earlier, which was written probably less than 60 years after the conclusion of Mary's earthly life, when memories of her life were still vivid in the minds of many. According to the, the patristic scholar Johannes Kasten, the principal aim of writing the Protevangelium of James was to prove the perpetual and inviolate virginity of Mary before, 
in and after the birth of Christ. Um, and just as, a, as another note, this was officially declared a dogma at the Fifth Ecumenical Council. While we don't recognize that council in the Armenian church, it's recognized by the Catholic and Orthodox churches, and we certainly don't disagree with that declaration of Mary as ever virgin. Okay, and related to that question was, is St. James the stepbrother of Jesus or half-brother? Since stepbrothers mean siblings that are related through marriage of their parents and half-brothers mean that they share at least one parent. Okay, Deacon Eric, can I have that one? Sure. <laughs> All right, uh, it depends a little bit on which tradition you belong to, um, how the, the word, how the, the names of, of Jesus's brothers, especially James, who becomes the most important one in his ministry and in the early church, are referred to. So sometimes James is referred to as the brother of the Lord. Sometimes he's spoken of as a cousin of the Lord. Um, it seems to hinge on uh, what the early uh, apocryphal literature, the literature that didn't make it into the canon, uh, thought about the family life of Jesus and Joseph and Mary. The most prevalent tradition is that Mary married quite young. She was 14 or 15, the normal age for marriage in the time period. And Joseph, on the other hand, was significantly older than she was. He already had several children, he was a widower, and um, he and Mary married in part because both of them belonged to the same priestly uh, lineage. And so it would be um, considered a very good thing for them to be together just as a social thing. But beyond that, that both she and Joseph had an idea uh, she first, and of course, Joseph afterwards, of who the son was that she was going to bear. And so there would be no problem for Joseph accepting the idea that this would be her only child. And at the same time, she would act as mother figure for both, for all of his children, however many there were. There seem to have been several because when uh, they come to see Jesus, it says, your mother and your brothers are outside. And in another place, it refers to, are not his brothers and sisters with us? So although the details are a little sketchy about how many siblings there were, um, that seems to be the, the crux of their relationship is that they were uh, stepbrothers and sisters. Thank you, Dr. Irvin. Um, I'm gonna give you another one. There's two more questions, one for Dr. Irvin and the last one is gonna be for Der Gurek. Uh, this next one for Dr. Irvin. Why do we, uh, the Armenians, have such extensive rites at the tomb of Mary? Uh, this is a great question. It's not just the tomb of Mary where Armenians have extensive rites. Uh, Armenians, as you saw on RP's map, own a quarter of the city of Jerusalem, and it's one of the larger quarters. Jerusalem is not evenly divided. And so although there is a Christian quarter, which is occupied mostly by Roman Catholic, Byzantine, and related Orthodox people, the Armenian quarter is its own creature. Part of the reason for this goes back to the time of Christ himself, when Armenians were serving, Armenians and others from the Caucasus were serving in the Roman military. At the time of Christ, the area where they were encamped was right along where now the Armenian seminary sits, just across from the, the gate of the seminary of the monastery proper. And so there's the idea that after the crucifixion, after they were involved in the events around that, some of them stayed on. And very early there was a chapel built over the or adjacent to the site of the house of. James, again, under the control of Armenians. And when Armenia converted to Christianity as the first nation to do so, the first nation to align itself with what would become the official religious stance of the Byzantine empire, that um, they were in line to receive special privileges and asked for them at the, at the same time. 
So Armenians had rights in the Holy Sepulchre Church, in all of the holy sites, including Mary's tomb. And there were several centuries where Armenians um, were the only group overseeing some of these sites. Of course, Jerusalem has a checkered and long history. So those configurations of control and uh, responsibility changed from time to time. Um, there were also times when Armenians were pretty much not, a, not in control of anything in the holy city. And in the time of the Crusades, pretty much everything is Roman Catholic and so on and so forth. Their present status at Mary's tomb is something that, this, <laughs> this sounds very counterintuitive, but it's something that the Armenians owe to the Ottomans. <clears throat> the Ottoman system of government for the Middle East favored those peoples who, while they were not Muslim, were considered indigenous to the Ottoman Empire. So that meant Armenians and Syrians primarily. And as favored people, as kind of natural children of the empire, uh, the Ottoman system looked at them with much more favor than it did, for example, Roman Catholics, whose primary affiliations are with European powers that the Ottoman government viewed as interfering in business in the Middle East. So Armenians um, did manage to gain a lot of the ground that they had lost thanks to arrangements with the Ottoman government. And then in 18, the 1850s, um, the situation had changed somewhat so that each confession had arranged a kind of uh, pipeline for itself into what was becoming a more corrupt version of the Ottoman government. And each group would, would pay a certain amount of money to bribe this person in the administration to give them uh, more rights than their neighbors. And then the neighbor would do the same thing. And so the, the government found that this was an excellent way to make money. And it became so corrupt that finally in the 1850s, when the uh, Crimean War began, it was decided simply to freeze the, the rights and privileges in the holy places as they were at that time. And fortunately for Armenians today, uh, Armenians were in an ascendant position at that time. There's one other thing I would like to mention in this context, and that is that as, as far as we can remember, Armenia is quite a small country in the Southern Caucasus. And that was not the case in antiquity or in the Middle Ages. You had Armenia was a, a, a much more vast expanse. It was a major player in regional politics in the Northern Middle East. And so it makes much more sense that Armenia with, with power, with prestige, with money, with troops and so on, was in a much better position in those days to consolidate its, the physical aspects of its devotion to Christ and the Holy Land. So in a nutshell, <laughs> uh, we owe what we have today in the Holy Land as a very small nation to what was accumulated previously when Armenia was a greater country and what was accumulated and then fortunately frozen at that exact moment in the 1850s. Thank you, Dr. Urban. The last question will end on a personal note, and this is to you again, uh, Der Gurek. Um, what were your favorite parts of serving at the tomb of Mary? Did you have anything that you were particularly drawn to while serving there? Uh, particularly, I liked serving as a deacon, and I liked the entire liturgy. Uh, the only thing that I would say is it's not easy to concentrate, pray, while you have Asuris on the other side and then Ghabtis uh, on the other side. So basically, sometimes you, we celebrate liturgy at the same time with uh, Asuris and Ghabtis. And it's, it's not easy to sing, to pray, and to concentrate while they are singing and praying with you. Thank you. Uh, that was it. Well, thank you everyone for your questions and thanks to our presenters for sharing your thoughts.
Um, it was truly a blessing to go on this journey with you uh, for our first attempt at putting a virtual pilgrimage together on Vemkar. Uh, we will be sending you two digital gifts. One is the full Mother of God prayer rule, which uh, Deacon Eric put together, and a full translation of the Assumption hymns by Father Nigoros Aznaburian. So as the celebration of the Assumption of the Mother of God continues, we suggest reading the full prayer rule for all nine days uh, of the feast starting tomorrow. Uh, and if you want to do more, you're welcome to reflect on the hymns. Uh, we will also be sending you a survey. Uh, it's very important for us to get your feedback so that we can incorporate uh, your thoughts, suggestions uh, for our future uh, pilgrimages. And uh, uh, we will do so tomorrow. And so please do expect an email from us. And uh, before I ask Father Gudev to give us his blessing, I'd like to once again, thank you, every, uh, thank you all for joining us. It, it truly has been a, a pleasure. And uh, the blessing that Der Gudev is gonna bestow upon us is actually rooted in the Jerusalem pilgrim blessing. So uh, Der Heir, it's your screen. Yes. Uh... So every time when we celebrate Easter in Jerusalem, uh, we celebrate Divine Liturgy on the Tomb of Christ on uh, Sunday morning. And then Monday should be Merilot. Uh, but in Jerusalem, we don't celebrate Merilot on Monday. Uh, we celebrate uh, Divine Liturgy, Patriarchal Divine Liturgy uh, at St. James. And after the liturgy, there is a procession with all the uh, holy relics. It is called Uchtaburatz. Badarak. For all those uh, pilgrims coming to Jerusalem, it's an opportunity for all of them to see, uh, to be able to kiss uh, all these box, all those little uh, boxes uh, which contain uh, the relics of the saints. And after that, after the third circle, when the patriarch and all the brotherhood uh, uh, does in a does at Saint James, they go up to the altar. They sing John Abar, and the patriarch gives the final blessing so that every pilgrim goes back to their homes. And we will be doing the same uh, part, which is again specifically comes from, from Jerusalem. Ortnial Dermer Jesus Christos Amen, Hairmer Vorerkin says, Surp Yagitianunko, Yekes Tsar Kayitunko, Yagitin Kamko, Vorpes Herkin the Severkri. Asats mer hana bazor tur mes aisor yev tog mes spartis mer vorpes yev meg togunk mer ot sparta banats yev mi tani ras mezi portutyun al perkaz mezi charen ziko yar kaytyun yev zorutyun yev park habitianas habitenits amen glorified and blessed ever holy virgin mary mother of god mother of christ present our supplications to your son and our god to live, to deliver us from tragedy and from all danger Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be happy and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Lo, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be, be upon Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and always and unto the ages of ages. Amen. <laughs> Lord, keep us on course along the path of peace. Lord, direct and guide our spirits and the spirits of all people of faith to walk with to walk this path of Christian integrity to eternal life. Amen. Let us ask Almighty God to keep his servants on course so that they may attain goodness and peace. Almighty Lord our God, raise us to life and have mercy on us. Leader of life, who give the gift of peace, 
Christ our God, lead us to walk your path of Christian integrity so that we may arrive peacefully at a harbor of life and salvation. By the grace of your mercy, for you are our helper and savior, and to you is befitting glory, dominion and honor, now and always and unto the ages of ages, amen. Or now that Mary Jesus Christos, amen. Hail Mary, what are you saying? Surp ye giti anun ko, ye kest ye arka yutun ko, ye giti in kam ko vor pes her kine sever kri. Asat mer hana bazur tur mezay sor, ye po mezas partis mer vor pes ye meg thowunt mer os parta banats. Ye mi tani jas mezi port yutun al per kias mezi charen. Ziko ye arka yutun ye zor yutun ye par kavit ye nas havit eni zamen. Be blessed by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Remain in peace. And may the Lord be with you all. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you.